how to build a better local economy. Um, so hopefully the panelists will discuss some strategies for how we can develop stronger, uh, more sustainable local economies. Uh, so um, I'm going to turn it over to, I think Gustavo is going first. So go ahead, Gustavo. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gustavo Aguirre and I work with Center on Race, Poverty and the Environment. Um, and we, most of the work that we do is uh, working with low-income communities uh, on you know, environmental issues. But uh, on 2008-2009, uh, we went to a, uh, a strategic planning our organization, including reviewing our name, which is a little bit long. So we were thinking, you know, yes, we work with low-income communities, but we are reacting you know, to polluters. Uh, and you know to government uh, you know policies that are against the communities and all of that but uh, so we were considering do we keep the our, the word uh, poverty do we remove it and if we keep it we need to honor it so we decide to keep uh, you know our name but it was uh, uh, you know including the poverty uh, with that in mind we went back to the communities and um, we wanted to find uh, some projects that communities with uh, some support can run themselves. And we didn't want to assume that we knew what kind of projects uh, communities can start. But we went back to the communities and asked them uh, you know, what uh, kind of projects they can develop. Uh, so uh, this is not working. Okay. Um, well, I think it's it's not uh, it's not moving for for some reason. Uh, so she tries to help me. So we went uh, uh, to the communities. I think it's working now. Okay, yeah. go back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Again, okay. it's um, not going back. Well. I think I'll improvise. We went, um, we went uh, to the communities and we held uh, about 10, 11 uh, community meetings and we invited uh, people from different industries, uh, people working in solars, people doing ag, community gardens, uh, you know, uh, some uh, local uh, career like trainings, uh, vocational, all of that. So we did all those kind of trainings and at the end, um, the communities uh, identified the, the farming as one of the projects that they can, they can uh, do and develop because, uh, you know, being in the San Joaquin Valley, a lot of people are from, uh, from rural communities and a lot of them have uh, experience in, in working at the fields. So um, they identified that as, um, as a project. Initially, we tried to start co-ops, small co-ops, uh, organic farming, but uh, the first research we did, uh, we, uh, we find out that it will take like three, four years to start something like that. Uh, and it's difficult to have uh, communities ready and waiting for four, three, four years. So we decided to start the community gardens. Um, and uh, when we start uh, that, uh, so after we did the, the trainings, uh, we start looking for, for uh, pieces of land. And um, currently we have three, three projects. Um, one of the projects is in uh, the community of Shafter. Um, the, in the community of Shafter, uh, we have about uh, 30, two acres of land. Uh, we have about 30 families uh, participating in that project. Uh, the land, uh, the, the school district uh, owns the land. They are borrowing it uh, to the communities without paying any, any fees. The city is paying for the water and my organization is providing the technical support, the capacity building for the, for the committees. Um, and um, the other project that we have is in the community of, uh, uh, it's called community of Greenfield. Uh, and up there we have uh, 20 families, it's about half acre of land. 
Uh, the city of Bakersfield uh, owned the land and they are paying also the water for, for that project. And CRP is providing the, the capacity building, the technical support to, to that uh, committee. Um, and uh, the third uh, uh, project that we are supporting is uh, in the community of Arvin. Uh, up there is about uh, one acre of land. Uh, we have about 40 families up there. And one, uh, actually the president of the committee is um, the owner of the land. Uh, he's not charging for the community project. Um, and um, so all these three projects, and we provide support to other groups, but directly these are the three, three uh, projects that my organization started. Uh, initially we had uh, one organizer uh, of our organization almost full time supporting these projects. Currently uh, I'm doing it uh, together with thousand other things that I have to do for my organization. Uh, we, each, or, each committee uh, develop the skills already to, uh, to administrate their own garden. I go to them almost every month just to have their monthly meetings, but other than that, it's very minimal the time that I have to put on that one. So pretty much those projects are sustainable. So the three projects together is almost uh, 100 families and that extends to other people. Uh, sometimes they produce a lot of, uh, you know, produce zucchinis, for example. Sometimes they don't know what to do because they, they uh, grow it for them, for their families, for their neighbors. Sometimes they take it to, the, to the chur their churches to share with the community. Mm -hmm. So it is uh, something that we learned that um, it works. Uh, and uh, I think it can be done everywhere, even here in Oakland. Uh, when I f we first started doing that, I was doing some research in uh, the city of Richmond in Virginia, the state of Virginia. They have two projects, one for families just to grow their own food, and the other one uh, for people that want to do business, you know, grow and sell. Uh, and they have to do those, uh, those two kind of projects, so it can be done everywhere. And um, uh, during this, our, our, uh, you know, this three, four years of uh, the project, obviously we develop uh, curriculums, you know, how to train the, the, the committees, the people that is participating on the, on the gardens, uh, how can we help them become, you know, independent from our, our organization. Uh, we can share those curriculums, obviously the capacity building, uh, helping that uh, committee to develop their leadership is very key because, you know, if you are dealing with 40 families, believe me, with, where there is people, there are dynamics. So they learn that, uh, you know, how to deal with that. Uh, and we are very proud um, that this, uh, this is uh, happening. So uh, that's part of uh, the experience that we had doing this. And obviously, uh, economically, is helping these, these uh, groups. Uh, the next step for them is uh, try to find land to start selling because with the, the three, well, actually two of the projects, uh, the agreements that we have for the use of the land, we are not allowed to sell because, uh, you know, it's uh, like government or school institutions, they don't want, you know, they, they want to keep it as community projects, but the people al already learn how to do that and we have a couple of groups that already start doing uh, the business on their own. So that's, this is one way that the community can benefit and, you know, sometimes people uh, keep uh, you know, their tomatoes freeze from one season to another. So economically, it's been a huge help to those people that in the San Joaquin Valley, they grow the food and sometimes they don't have the access because of, you know, poverty. Thank you. Um, so my name is. Do I just on this? So is this correct? I don't you know. 
Um, so my name is Aaron Fernando. Uh, I work with an organization called Bay Bucks, which uh, my colleague Mike Lamuto also works with. Um, what we are is a, a business to business barter network and a local currency. So um, basically it's a, a network of businesses that trade with one another using uh, a means that is not the US dollar. It's just um, it's as if businesses are trading using a dollar, but it's a digital uh, unit of account that is not pinned to a dollar. So um, there are many different types of local currencies throughout the US and the world, and they each um, are, are sort of targeted at um, strengthening the local economy and um, specifically allowing money to circulate within there and not flood out. Um, so there was a, a study done um, a few years ago um, in like Salt Lake City and found that uh, when you spend locally, um, only about 32 for 32%, so $32 for every 100 spent, um, leaves the, the local area. Uh, whereas when you spend at a big box or chain store, and these are averages, um, about 57% of it goes away. Um, it is very difficult to keep 100% of um, all spending locally because you have things like taxes, fuel, um, various like services and resources that come from non-local areas. But in general, spending locally um, keeps that wealth generated by the community within the community. Um, so the, one of the issues that tends to crop up is that sometimes local goods, very often local goods are a bit more expensive. Um, so during times of recession, this might actually put businesses out of business uh, due to the fact that when people are tight on cash, they're going to, they're going to opt to go to like Walmart rather than spend at the, the local equivalent, uh, the local um, whatever supplier. Um, when you have a system more like Bay Bucks or local currency, um, you cannot spend those at the big store. So you have that added incentive to spend it um, locally. Another thing that um, a local currency allows that a national currency does not is for growth to match the community's needs. Um, the reason for this is because a national currency, like every currency on earth that is um, used countrywide, uh, is created out of lending. So a central bank will lend to other banks, which lend to other banks, which will make loans. Um, so the vast majority of money, it's like about 97%, is actually some form of debt. That means that it has to be paid back with interest at some point in time. Um, the problem with having this as a feature of most money is that growth has to happen. Um, if it does not happen, then something has to default. It can be a person, it can be an entire sector, an entire country. That's why we see like Puerto Rico defaulting right now, because things like this can happen. And there's other reasons why Puerto Rico defaulted. But, um, this, it's something that is uh, rather vicious about um, national currencies. Um, there are movements to change this, and some of them are uh, top-down, um, especially like in the UK and uh, Netherlands, they have these movements to uh, sort of raise awareness that money should, be, should come into existence in a different way. Um, and we're sort of like the bottom-up approaches. So there are a few others around the country. Um, Better known ones might be like Berkshires in Massachusetts, uh, Ithacash in Ithaca, New York. Um, yeah, and so what we do, instead of um, creating money to bear debt, uh, we have uh, interest-free um, currency, which is Bay Bucks. So when, when one business purchase from, purchases something from another, because right now it's just business to business, um, the business that sells gets a credit and the business that buys gets a debit of equivalent amounts. Um, and neither of those things bear interest. So the holding a whole lot of Bay Bucks is not gonna make anyone richer. And having to take a loan is not going to make you have to pay the lender um, extra interest, which like is no, was known in the past as usury. Um, and so this is uh, one way of addressing um, 
that is that systemic issue. Um, there's another set of studies that have found that um, about 80% of uh, all people lose out on interest, 10% about break even, and then it's like the top 10% that um, are collecting the interest of the rest of everyone. Um, so this is one of the drivers of inequality. Of course, there is like uh, land speculation, as as his will be discussed, um, I'm sure. Uh, but then uh, interest and debt is another thing that absolutely drives and, and keeps inequality uh, in its comfortable position. So that was actually the reason why I got interested in this, was like from that kind of theoretical background and looking at how to shift money away from being this thing that can just be hoarded by those who are already rich and that is so scarce and, and makes um, the disadvantaged have to act in vicious and self-destructive ways. Um, Bay Bucks right now is uh, in its fourth year, so started in 2012. Um, we have about 286 businesses. Um, we're growing, we're, we're trying to get like the, the bigger things like uh, grocery stores. Um, and um, yeah, that's basically, um, I just like prepped the, the basics about Bay Bucks and then Mike will uh, follow up about the specifics and what he does beyond Bay Bucks. Right. Oh, actually, where are you going to go? Well, maybe it might actually make sense to me. Okay. All right. I'll put this little fuzzy thing in here. Um, right on. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Aaron has been awesome to work with. Um, I started with Bay Bucks about a year ago, and Aaron joined about at the beginning of the year. So we've been working together for a little while now, kind of uh, just trying to figure out how to grow Bay Bucks, basically. Um, one of the things that Aaron said um, that kind of struck with me is also, uh, you know, one of the reasons I think that people don't spend at small businesses as much as they do, of course, is because of the financial side of it. But then there's the trust side too, right? A lot of times it's like, you know, with your car oil change, for example, you know, you don't, if you go to a regular mechanic, it's going to cost more than going to Pennzoil. You, some people might go to that regular mechanic if they know who to go to, but they don't know who to go to. So you're gonna, rather than spend $40 and go to a mechanic you don't know who might take advantage of you, you're gonna go to Pennzoil and spend $20 because at least it's only $20. And I think on a practical level, that's one of the things that Bay Bucks helps to solve is creating a network of people that trade with each other, that know each other. Um, we used to do events and we're gonna get back into doing some, some events for people to mix and mingle. Uh, but also just knowing that this is somebody that's part of our network that basically came through either another Bay Bucks member or through someone on the Bay Bucks team, I think goes to speak a long way towards creating trust. And for me, I think that trust is probably one of the biggest things in creating local economy. And I think it's one of the biggest reasons that if you look at, you know, whether it's the media, whether it's the government, whatever you want to call it, you know, there's a lot of distrust that's put out there. Um, and I, I really do believe that that's a big part of what keeps us from doing business with each other. Um, I mean, there's even a lot of people that say, don't do business with friends. Don't do business with family. It'll all go bad. But traditionally, for millennia, people did business with friends and with family. <laughs> and that's how they survived, and that's how they got through hard times. Um, now we're more likely to go hire Pennzoil or go to Walmart. So with Bay Bucks for me, um, so I, I grew up in San Francisco and I spent most of my 20s and early 30s kind of traveling around the entire country but always coming back home every few months, every month really, um, and trying to build uh, something I call the modern global village. I found Chong Ki a couple years ago because somebody that I knew was a member and said, hey, go talk to this guy. So I went and talked with Chong Ki, I realized, wow, Okay, what I've been trying to do, which is just kind of piece people together, he's actually created a platform, which is this currency that we can all use together. So it's not just simply calling your friend, it's also like going into a database and seeing who my friends are that are offering businesses and services. Um, and once again, like I said, Victoria Armigo, um, I, I grew up with her daughter and she's the one who referred me. So when she said, yeah, Chong is a really good person, has integrity, I said, great. And um, I think that a lot of times people don't realize what's in their local network a lot of the times. 
Um, we might realize it when we go to a dinner party and we're talking with somebody and, oh, you know, so-and-so does blank, right? But then we forget about it. And then how do we connect with them later? Unless if, you know, maybe we send an email. Maybe that email gets read, maybe it gets answered, maybe it doesn't. And I think that's a big problem because I know for me growing up here, when my friends and we, we get together, everybody just wants to hang out and nobody talks business at all. And that's great, I understand that. But at the same time, it's like, you know, we all, we're all struggling to make it. So, and we know we all have resources and skills and talents and stuff. So I think what Baybucks does is it allows for a place that we can start kind of, okay, let's get added to the network and let's figure out a way to then interact with each other and then also not have to spend dollars which, you know, go through banks and whatever that means, right? <laughs> so, you know, as opposed to, um, you know, something that Aaron left out is that, uh, you know, the, the goods and services are what back your Bay Bucks. So, um, you know, House Kombucha backs their Bay Bucks with House Kombucha. So at any point in time, if they have a debt, uh, so to speak, uh, of, cow of, of, of Bay Bucks, well, they can pay for it in House Kombucha. <laughs> they don't have to pay for it by going and figuring out some way to find cash that maybe doesn't exist or maybe they could use for their taxes or for their rent or mortgage or whatever else. And that's, I think, one of the strong things about Bay Bucks. That's why I joined uh, Bay Bucks and started working with Chunky, um, because I saw it as a way to really um, take the building of network and trust to another level. Um, so just to, if anybody knows anybody, if any of you are small business owners or know any small business owners in the Bay Area, um, definitely let us know. Um, we're specifically looking for restaurants and businesses and things like uh, uh, restaurants and, and uh, grocers and things like that. Um, because we, we really want to eventually get to a point where we um, are able to offer Bay Bucks to residents. Um, the, one of the stepping stones to that would be to allow for um, companies, small business owners, to pay their employees in Bay Bucks. Not necessarily 100% because then people wouldn't be able to pay their rent and so on and so forth. But, you know, to pay maybe like bonuses here and there in Bay Bucks. And then eventually that would be... Um, can, uh, transitioning into where everybody can use Baybox, and because everybody has something to offer, and you know a lot of people, you know whatever it is, whether it's you know giving lessons in guitar in the evening, which a lot you know I have friends that do that kind of stuff, and that's the thing they love, you know. So imagine being able to do that and create Baybox and buy house kombucha with that. <laughs> so that's the goal that we want to have eventually. Um, for myself, um, a little bit of, of background is um, I have a few companies um, that I've been building over the last few years, and one of them is um, a uh, traditional Asian medicine company. Um, I'm a trained acupuncturist and herbalist. I grew up using natural medicines my whole life. I uh, grew up in the outer sunset in San Francisco, so very um, Asian population. Uh, my mom's from Thailand, so that she grew up using the same types of medicine. and um, I. I'm launching a corporation this month, next month, hopefully, <laughs> um, that does corporate wellness in, um, in cor on site, and we bring in acupuncture, herbs, uh, Asian bodywork therapy. Uh, my reason for bringing this up as far as local economy is the way that we built this was I wanted to hire, I wanted to build a company I could hire my friends at, and so I just started working on building a company and said, okay. Let's build a company. Every time I need something, I go to my network first. I literally have, you know, now it's evolved, but I used to just have a list on paper of all my friends. And anytime I needed anything, I would just go through that list and call them. And sometimes I had money that came in from, you know, people investing and helping me out with the business. Sometimes it was just, hey, can you help me out? And then I helped them out with something as well, and we just kind of basically barter and trade. Um, the whole, the point in, 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 the reason I did that and the reason I continue to do that is because I think that, um, you know, like I said, we can easily go hire other people we don't know. We can go hire outside the community. We can go online. You know, when I did, uh, when I, we did our logo design, everybody kept saying, go do 99designs.com. You can get a logo for $100 or whatever, right? And that's great. Um, and I'm not t t saying people shouldn't do that. But for me, it was really important that I went and got my logo done by somebody I grew up with. And you know, somebody who, I remember his, him doing you know, street art at like when we were 15, 16 years old and stuff. And now he's doing my logo. So, you know, and that money then stays not only in the local San Francisco community, but in my local group of friends. So, I don't know if I'm rambling or anything right now, but uh, <laughs> I've kind of uh, trailed off with my thoughts. Um, 
so yeah, I don't know. There's a few minutes left. I, I think that says I, I'm having trouble seeing that. That says five minutes. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, so, ago, okay. So I'm at two minutes now. Okay, cool. All right. So in that case, I'm going to go ahead and hand over the microphone. <laughs> All right. Unless if um, did you say we're doing Q and A after, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Awesome. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and you need the fuzzy thing now. All right. So hello, my name is Chelsea Rustrum, and actually I'm really excited to be here because Bill is one of the very first, actually it's the first conference I ever spoke about, I spoke, I ever spoke about the sharing economy at uh, back in Long Beach, maybe four years ago. So first off, I want to tell you a little bit about me and my sharing economy story and how that led to doing a documentary and a book and a few other things. And then I want to get into talking about distributed value and how we can move forward with different types of business models that actually distribute value in the form of ownership and governance to the value creators themselves. And we'll get more into that and as I get into this. So moving back maybe five years ago or so, I had moved to San Francisco and I had, a, had an internet business and my traffic went down by about 50% and I thought, you know what, I'm doing so well, I'm, I can live in San Francisco, I can get this apartment and then I had half my income overnight. So I found Airbnb and I knew about it and I had discovered couch surfing previously. So I started experimenting with sharing. And so I had people come and stay on my couch. This is my studio apartment as pictured above. And I had maybe 50 people stay 20 feet away from me. So we'd go to sleep together, we'd wake up together. Um, and that was, that was transformative actually. It was, a, it was a way of seeing how trust works, I guess. In a way that when you trust someone else, maybe they trust you and you create this sort of instant bond, especially when they stay inside of your home. So that led me to think about what else I could share, which eventually included my car and my stuff and doing lots and lots of sharing experiments. And before that, I'd actually helped with a couch surfing documentary called One Couch at a Time. And I ended up being a subject in that film and traveling all over the place with that after, for those of you that don't know what couch surfing is, it's a, it's a hospitality network that allows you to stay anywhere in the world. There's 12, there's 12 million members and you can stay anywhere in the world for free. People host you for free and you can go to events and you can kind of just hang out with locals and expatriates and things of that nature. So it's, it's a really, really beautiful thing. So after all of that, uh, a few of us decided to write a book titled It's a Shareable Life, which was crowdfunded, and I know you mentioned using the local economy. <laughs> um, we actually did use 99designs and a few other things, but we also crowdsourced some content and crowdsourced, crowdfunded for it and tried to use the sharing economy as much as possible to actually create the book. So now, as you guys know, I think, um, the sharing economy has proliferated to everything. This is Craigslist, and this is just showing a map of all of the areas of Craigslist that have expanded into sharing economy type companies and marketplaces. So we've seen explosive growth in that. So maybe this is the part that relates more to the local economy, is how do, we, how do we build these networks and these marketplaces in a way that's nurturing to the people that are actually creating the value in the first place? Um, and I think uh, what I'm going to talk about relates to that directly. So this is moving from a sharing economy to a shared economy, which is something that I've had to come to because, you know, the sharing economy, in my opinion, has become quite exploitative and a lot of people you know, are working for below minimum wage and working long hours and working super hard and don't have any kind of protections um, when it comes to their hourly pay or um, you know, insurance or things of that nature. It moved from people basically just sharing their stuff with each other, you know, for extra income and for fun to this being full-time income for a lot of people, or at least supplementary, supplementary income, which is a big difference. So I wanted to start with this. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. This was said by William Gibson, an economist, quite a few years ago in 2003. 
This is something I've always seen and one of the reasons I've always, always been excited about the internet. I do see it as an equalizing uh, force over time. There's only three billion people currently online. You know, there's still quite a few that aren't. And I, I look at this as like, how are we powerful as a group, as a connected nation and as a planet? So as we've gone through, people are already sharing. You know, the sharing economy has exploded. We've got crowd, you know, crowd everything, online education, the maker movement, DIY bio, co-working, open source, we've got lots of commoning going on, and even uh, a huge growth in digital nomadism, which is uh, sh uh, pointing at the future of work. So my proposition is that they're just not organized yet. So we're not organized in how we're sharing. There's platforms that are providing it as a service. But what if, what if the workers themselves, what if the users themselves, what if the people that are actually generating the value in these platforms owned it and governed it? So what are we talking about sharing? Well, over time, profit, governance, housing, transportation, all of these things can be shared, right? So to give you some examples to ground this a little bit better, let's talk about this in terms of specifics. So platform cooperatives are this idea of attaching a typical cooperative business model to the digital environment. So it's a way to distribute value through shared, shared ownership and governance. So this could be users, members, employees, customers, providers, and participants sharing ownership and governance along the way. So here's some examples. Uber doesn't own any cars, and yet they're one of the biggest transportation companies in the world, and they have skyrocketing valuations up to 100, 100 billion. Airbnb, same thing. Uh, they don't own a single piece of real estate, and yet they're one of the largest uh, hotel providers in the world. Facebook, one of the biggest media companies. How do we kind of take a step back from this and say, all right, technology is great, but Who's actually creating the value for these things? Whose cars? Whose time? Whose house? Whose extra rooms? Whose media? Whose information? So I'm going to skip over a little bit of this because I'm talking quite a bit. But uh, what is a platform cooperative in terms of the difference between a typical company? It is a, it's similar to a nonprofit in a way where surplus is the goal. Um, but the employees and sur suppliers, customers, whoever, whoever the value creators are themselves are the ones that are able to govern it and are the ones that own it. And through that, there's sort of this interplay. I mean, it, it can be set up however, however one wants to set it up, but there's this interplay between it operating like a typical company and also bridging that gap that unions used to provide for. So this is a Fast Company article. I just wanted to show you guys some examples of this. The People's Uber, why the sharing economy must share ownership. There's a few smaller companies that are creating localized Uber, Uber companies that are based on a digital cooperative or a platform cooperative model. This is something called Stocksy. This is a, if you guys remember iStock Photo, it still exists, but a few of the original co-founders of iStock Photo started Stocksy, and they're just giving more of the profits back to the photographers themselves. This is stock photography, and they're also providing ownership in the platform. So there's more on platform cooperativism if you guys want to learn more about this on platformcoop.net. And you can check out the video section. There's a ton of uh, information. There was a huge conference about this at the end of last year. And then other examples that I see, OK, one minute, uh, pointing at shared value in the future are, this is just a, a quick quote by Jared Lehner, someone to look into as well, about who owns the future. He's talking about here um, our personal data and information uh, and the transfer of wealth. So Reddit also looked at shared value a few years ago. I think this was in 2014. They raised a bunch of money and said, hey, we're going to give away uh, stock to community members. And I think we'll continue to see more of this. 
And last but not least, this was just a few weeks ago, T-Mobile uh, said that they're going to give a stock to each of its customers, and for every customer that one um, refers, they'll give another share of stock. This is actual stock in the stock exchange. So thank you very much. Thank you all for those presentations. Those were great. Uh, I just wanted to ask the panel sort of one question that has a two components to it that then hopefully each of you will have a chance to respond to, and then maybe we can open it up for question and answers. Uh, trust is obviously a really big theme in all of these sorts of projects that you work on, whether it's community farming, to local currency, to sh the shared economy. And I'm wondering if you see this trust issue as being why we can't expand a lot of what your organizations are doing to a national or even global level. I mean, there's some, there's some ways to mit mitigate the trust or minimize the trust issue when you're dealing with certain of the companies that you uh, mentioned, but trust is obviously a really big issue. And so I guess my question is to the panel is, how do you, how do you, get, how do you solve the trust issue on a bigger scale? Because I think it's easier to address in a local place, in a local community, where you know people or you at least know that they're a part of the same community that you're a part of. Anybody can start. I think uh, you're right. I think to have uh, successful partnerships, projects, anything, uh, you need the, the trust. And the trust, uh, you cannot claim the trust, you cannot demand the trust, you need to earn it. And I think uh, organizations or, or non-profits or groups, no matter who, is trying to put something together to make uh, a you know, positive impact, uh, they need to have you know clear values, uh, good values that can easily gain the trust, you know, that what they that organization or person says uh, is what the people is going to uh, believe and because they know that that organization or person is going to hold to those values and you know they know what they see is what, what it is. I wonder if behind that question is um, how do we scale trust? Yeah, how do we scale trust and how do we, I mean, I think this gets asked a lot in business, like how do we scale this local thing that's so awesome and make it available to everybody? And I think the answer to that is like, maybe like scale is the wrong question or maybe it's like the wrong word. I think that um, local level sort of commerce is some of the best type of commerce that we can possibly do. So I think the question that I would ask is like, how do we, how do we replicate this? And uh, in the cooperative model, there's something called a federation where you can create a federation of cooperatives that are all connected, but they're all locally grounded. So I think local is actually beautiful and I think that we should should stay there and, and come back to that versus trying to scale everything massively and create conglomerates that scale trust somehow. Because relationships are trust, right? I trust you because I know you and I can see your face. Um, we, can, we can definitely help scale trust via platforms and talking about who we are and things like LinkedIn and Googling each other and things like that. But I would say that's not the same thing as fully trusting someone. That's something different. Um, when it comes to when it comes to um, currencies, I actually think that um, on different scales, there are entirely different principles that currencies uh, behave on. And for a local currency, it should be trust-based um, and can be. And uh, as as we had talked about, um, they are based on um, producers backing things with goods and services. So um, on a national or international level, there's actually, um, you kind of have to assume that there will be some bad players sometimes. Um, and actually, I was reading into um, the Bretton Woods Conference when uh, 
the, um, the foundations for why the U.S. became so dominant globally um, after World War II uh, in the economy. Um, John Maynard Keynes, uh, probably the best known economist, um, had an idea for creating a, a global currency called Bancor that would actually um, sort of use interest to siphon off uh, like a vault of for when things go bad. Um, so that there's basically like bailout money, but it's actually it's actually there, um, because I think on a on a local scale, you're you're not trying to, most people are not trying to, do things to destroy their um, their community, but on a global scale, you might have very large, powerful, selfish players, um, and you should design the system so that it can tolerate that rather than hoping that you can trust. So I think it's different on, on the different scales. Well, does that mean I'm not supposed to speak right now? Or? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I hope we can scale it, <laughs> um, trust. Uh, otherwise, Bay Bucks is going to stay fairly small. But I, I do fully understand and agree with what, what Chelsea's over here saying. Um, I, I think that for, for me, when I look at that question, uh, how do we scale trust? How do we get it to go larger? Um, you know, I think that um, it starts with the individuals, and I don't think that most people trust themselves or know who they really are themselves yet. I think a lot of companies don't know who they are or trust themselves yet either. Um, I think that you know it's a lot easier to trust somebody else, so to speak, when you feel comfortable and solid in yourself. Um, and I think that. In general, our, our country isn't exactly geared towards people doing a lot of self-exploration and self-discovery and figuring out how to really trust in their own abilities and in their own skills and in their own self. Um, so I think for me, answering that question really, it's that um, you know, in order to scale, uh, one of the things we've been doing with Baybucks is doing a lot of internal branding work the last few months. Um, and really doing a deeper dive and figuring out like, and asking ourselves the hard questions about who are we and what are we really trying to do. Um, how can we get others to trust us if we don't even know the answers to those questions? And it doesn't mean we're going to try to mislead anybody. Um, and I don't think most people try to mislead others. I don't think that trust often is broken because of an intentional uh, bad act. I don't think most people are bad. I think most people mean well and are trying to be trustworthy. But I think a lot of times when we don't know what our own brand is, what our own self is. It's, it's really hard to then go and work on a larger scale. Um, so I, I, I'd say that the answer, my answer, I guess, you know, in going around in a couple of circles, I guess, um, is that, yeah, um, I think that the, the place to start in order to really go larger is with the self and the, the small and figuring out that, yeah. Is that cool. Real quick, I think um, trust is also just contextual. Like, who I trust to use my car or share my car with versus who I trust to babysit my kids that I don't have yet versus, <laughs> you know, things of that nature. I think that it, it, it changes across the board depending on what the, what the situation is. I think those situations are also different than a business trusting another business to provide a good or service or something like Baybox. Um, I think what we're actually talking about here, at least in this context, is reputation. Like, who is this person and how do I trust them enough to assume that they're going to do what they say they're going to do? Well, I think actually it would be beneficial to take some questions and, uh, questions from the audience. Try to be brief with your question and allow the, the, uh, someone on the panel to respond. So we'll start over here. Uh, you know, I was just wondering if like, some of these uh, Uber and stuff like that, they've been taking advantage of Citizens United. I know they've been buying, they've been buying a lot of politicians' favors. And recently, uh, Uber got, uh, got involved with Saudi Arabia. So now Saudi Arabia has great influence in Uber's influence. So my question is, they're using that, and you can't see them join them. So what can, uh, on what scale can you guys start influencing the politics in the ways that Uber is, or Saudi Arabia is using Uber? Did you guys all hear that question? How is Saudi Arabia? I'm sorry. Okay, so, okay, so Uber is 
quote unquote bribing a lot of congressmen, right? The favors, um, taking them to private dinners and things like this. And not to, uh, I think last week, Saudi Arabia bought a big portion of Uber. So Saudi Arabia now has creative influence on oh, Uber's great. influence of their bottom politicians. Okay. So, so how, <coughs> how can the conglomerates generations of cooperatives come together to combat that? Because I think that's another big part of the trust issue. So, okay, so then just to sort of paraphrase, and so it gets picked up on the, the camera as well. So you're, you're mentioning Uber, which has now grown so large that it has some power and some clout, and it's able to influence uh, policy in a way that other smaller organizations maybe cannot do that. And so your question is really, how can the continuously smaller organizations still have some of that political clout as well? I mean, I think you answered part of that question with mentioning the Federation of Cooperatives. I mean, really, I mean... Could you please pass the mic? Sure. Uh, I was just saying, I think that you answered some of that question in talking about a Federation of Cooperatives. I mean, realistically, it's going to take a groundswell and a huge groundswell of local cooperatives creating a Federation of Cooperatives to create a competitive advantage against something like Uber. And with Uber having so much capital and political clout and things of that nature, it's going to take a force. But like we said, there's three billion people online and there's... You know, I mean, if, if something's better for people, like that is a competitive advantage. And if there is an alternative, I do believe that people will use it if it's just as good, if not better. Anyone else? Yeah, sure. So that's for the month. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I personally, I don't, I don't use Uber. Um, and I, I generally don't use a lot of the, um, the, you know, sharing economy things that are of larger scale, uh, because I, I do have trust issues with them. Um, I don't know if we can, so to speak, compete with their political clout, <laughs> um, but I do feel that by, you know, using as much of our local economy as possible, we might not be able to influence like big political decisions, but we can at least. Uh, find, make sure that those dollars do end up more in our community's pockets and, you know, and then maybe through creating a smaller, uh, a stronger small community, you know, have some kind of influence in the political spectrum. Um, but, you know, personally, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's a great question because <laughs> I don't know. You know, if we could figure it out, then I think the world would be a very different place. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Let's try taking another question. Yeah, so my question is specific to uh, Matt and Aaron, and that is, you didn't really discuss the specifics of how the, um, the currency works. Is it cryptocurrency, or is it, is it another, is it yeah, currency, or is it uh, No, so it's actually, um, it's not a cryptocurrency, it's a centralized database. Um, and uh, there's really not, technically there's not very much like complicated about it. Um, it's, it's just a, a centralized ledger. Um, but the way it works is that it, when, um, basically everyone starts at zero. And when you, when you purchase something, you get a debit and the business you purchase from gets a credit. So money is actually created in that moment. Um, it's called a mutual credit system, and it's based on something bigger called LETS. Um, so the the number, the amount of money in the system, when you add up all the credits and all the debits, is always going to equal zero. Um, and then if the if people start paying off their debts to the creditors, it the number of money will or like the amount of money will sort of decrease, but it doesn't really matter. Um, the activity is just based on how capable and willing businesses are to transact with one another. Does that, does that make sense? So barter tracking. What's that? And barter tracking. Yeah, yeah. So it's just, yeah, it's barter. It's called a modern barter system because it, um, businesses don't have to transact one to one. You can buy something from this business and then in order to settle that debit, you sell something to another one. So, yeah. Uh, thank you to the panelists, and if you have more questions for them, stick around and ask them after the session. Okay.